We pray that you will glorify yourself, manifest your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let us be aware of the Spirit of God within. Hallelujah. As I heard the songs tonight, the songs that I heard spoke to me of the kingdom of God. What was that first thing you were singing? Come and let us go unto the mountain of the Lord Zion. That's the seat of government. That is the headquarters of divine government, isn't it? The throne, the place of, of the throne. And I think I can discern that though we have done much, and just thinking about Bible school forms, how it becomes a norm to prepare an intellectual study on the basis of Scripture, oftentimes, doesn't it? And so with all of our doing and all that we have done, I am aware of a great unfilled void within. Are you? We would not be characterized as a satisfied people, but rather you would characterize the present scene as one of hunger, frustrated hunger, and as seeing the people of God as sheep without a shepherd wandering. That's the way I see it. When I was in <clears throat> Corvilla preaching a couple weeks ago, we had some strife in the convention. There was a group of young people there from North Carolina who were very, very frustrated. In fact, the one brother whom I became friendly with, he said, I'm so frustrated I could scream. Do you know anything about frustration tonight? Any of you? You know something about frustration? They hit a nerve. They hit a nerve. And I don't really precisely know what I'm going to say tonight. God has been gripping me with the idea of the kingdom. And an idea, I think you know more than an idea, not an abstract, but a, a real burning reality that will change life and fill it full of meaning. That's really what you're questing for is meaning. People who think they have attained meaning don't quest anymore. They sit down. They settle down. Praise God. So I'd like to say a few things about the kingdom of God tonight. Because I heard that theme in the choruses. Did you hear it tonight? The kingdom of God. And several different choruses. Uh, the asking for the latter rain. And that brings me to the idea that uh, I think Follett had as a major point in his teaching, God deals with us largely by our desire. The Lord has contrasted to me lately the desire in the heart and something that might come over you like a prophecy. What would you do if you had a desire in your heart and then someone gave you a prophecy that was completely opposite to the desire? You'd have a problem on your hands then, wouldn't you? And what would you do? Would you try to walk into prophecy or would you follow the, the desire of your heart? What would you do? I don't know what you would do, but I would follow the desire of my heart. <laughs> Glory to God. Because that's what God has put in me. And I'm not talking about a carnal heart or just carnal desires, things of this world. Hallelujah. One thing the Lord revealed to me Praise God, I feel the presence of the Lord. <laughs> you know, I am so dead. I have had so much frustration, so much disappointment. I am so dead that if, unless I feel his power, I can't do a thing. I believe that I am a normal human being and I could make little teachings and sermons. But I have to confess to you, I don't have the heart to do it. I don't have the heart to do it. Because I am utterly discouraged about natural religion and all these things. I am a ruined man, for I have seen the glory. 
<laughs> and I never knew how real this ruins you, how really it ruins you. But it's like Jacob when he came face to face with God in a place he called Peniel, which means face of God, and wrestled with the angel of the Lord successfully, yet went limping from that experience, a cripple. A near encounter with God will render you a cripple in this world. One of the things I noticed about when God raised up a lot of the healers and miracle workers about 30 years ago, they all came to crisis and many of them came to the verge of nervous breakdowns, physical breakdowns from overworking themselves, building churches and, and organization. They all came to a crisis and many of them were wrecks. And the Lord visited them at that point and raised them up and anointed them. And they had compassion because they knew what it was like. You know, Earl Roberts was a tubercular and a stammerer. William Branham lost five members of his family in about 18 months. Held his little baby in his hands and her eyes crossed from the pain of spinal meningitis, TB of the spine, and prayed and a black curtain came down over him. God wouldn't hear his prayer because he had disobeyed. But later, when that revival broke, in three months, he picked up 400 cross-eyed children, and in the mere act of picking them up, their eyes were straightened. Didn't pray a prayer. He picked them up. Their eyes came out straight. Hallelujah. So I'm not living for this present quality of life we're experiencing. I have my eye on something better. Praise God. The Lord revealed to me the other day, and as Sister Harriet Moore was speaking, the spirit of revelation came upon me. And I don't know if I can say to you what I saw. I wish I could. But I found that in this ministry there is there is a very, very profound sense in which your the opening of your mouth is dependent on what God does, the operation of grace. Unless the spirit operates, there is nothing. See, in this age, in, in, in what we're living now, in this present arrangement, the spirit is the sine qua non of life and of experience and of reality. What does that mean? That's a little Latin motto that means that, which out, that without which there is nothing. I can't get impressed over $500,000 organs and uh, stained glass windows wrought by great artists and plush pews. And I can't get impressed over that. But my heart is reaching, I feel a, a reaching out on an eternal line. I feel a yearning, a longing, and, a, and I feel the flame of the heart's desire reaching and piercing up through this debris that has been heaped upon us. And the Lord revealed to me one little thing. What's wrong with the kingdom? And I'm not finding fault with God's kingdom, of course. I'm talking about other kingdoms. What's the problem with kingdoms? The problem with the kingdom is there's a headquarters and a headquarters, which is usually a palace, there's a throne. A little Gothic instrumentality, something like this. There's a throne. And then way over in the backside somewhere is your little shack. And you live there. <laughs> And you cannot have a relationship with the king. Did you hear me? You'll never get to know him, except by some fortuitous chance that you may be a genius or rich or be related as a distant cousin or something. But chances are, in a realm, in a kingdom, there'll be a vast gulf between you and the king, and you'll stand out with 500,000 people and watch him and go by in a parade someday. That's not for me. I'm in a kingdom where I was introduced right here. Glory. My introduction to this kingdom was to meet the king himself. The king called me in. He gave me a ticket. He paid for it. Hallelujah. 
With his own blood which was shed on Calvary. Hallelujah. Brought me to his throne, to his banqueting table. Set me beside himself at the head of the table. I believe every newborn Christian has that privilege. There's my little girl who's, what, three months old? Is that what she is? And uh, I've spent quite a bit of time looking into her eyes intimately and talking to her, making babbling sounds. <laughs> which I used to be quite above all that <laughs> but the Lord's my path in the kingdom is, is down 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 to learn to be a worm of the dust hallelujah Amen. we used to send our offerings to rich ministries that took in a million or millions per year Never, never, never had a hope of meeting the man we were sending our money to. You wrote a letter through the mail, and it was thought that he prayed for you when he got the letter. And I saw, heard one man say he was at headquarters one time, and a tractor trailer load, 50,000 letters came in. He said, do you think that man wrote all those letters? That took hundreds of employees to read all those letters, maybe. I'm not in the world to stop that sort of thing, but I'm not in the world to promote it either. I'm here to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, isn't the kingdom of heaven a lot different from other kingdoms? Isn't that a vast qualitative difference? You know, at some point in your Christian life, you will stop running after other men. You know that? may not be now, but it will be someday. You will either mature and you outgrow it, or you'll get weary and disgusted and quit. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, I wish I could just bestow on you everything your hearts desire. But I'll tell you about one who can. His name is Jesus. Yes. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. And as Sister Harriet was teaching along, the Lord gave me some revelation. I don't know. Uh, I just want to... Uh, I just want to read something out of John chapter 5 here. I am being progressively gripped more and more by the kingdom. I don't want to call it the kingdom message, I'll call it the kingdom reality or kingdom life. It could be rendered a message in several different ways. <clears throat> And the thing that I have to say, and the thing about the kingdom, the kingdom is rather difficult to talk about. We know, notice that Jesus taught about the kingdom through parables. We further notice in analyzing the life of Jesus of Nazareth, what the Bible says he was doing was continually teaching of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Is that right? Jesus was continually teaching his disciples of the things concerning the kingdom of God. We also know that he was continually going about doing good and healing those that were oppressed of the devil, wasn't he? Amen. I have noticed in my historical analysis of visitations of God, movings of his spirit. How many of you love the moving of the spirit of the Lord? Glory. What's that old song they sing? Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. And not say a prayer. Pray! Hallelujah! Get into the uh, divine dynamic of communing with God. Hallelujah! When you feel the Spirit moving. Glory to God. I, have, I believe the biggest factor in my life in 20 years has been the moving of the Spirit. That is the biggest factor in my life. I wasted a lot of time, but the biggest factor has been the moving of the Spirit in my life. I've heard from God recently, and I'm expecting great things. This is a time, a moment, an hour of expectancy. Amen. Glory to God. I believe that we are teetering on the brink of the <laughs> falling into the <laughs> bottomless abyss of divine blessings. Glory. 
Let yourself go. Amen. Fall in. Hallelujah. And uh, the Lord has been beginning to speak to me about the kingdom for several years now. I began to hear some years ago that out of the latter rain revival there came a body of men called kingdom preachers. Just as the body of Christ idea was not preached or talked about much before the last 30 year period, so also the kingdom of God was not mentioned much. The gospel of the kingdom was rarely mentioned in religious circles. But the, there is something about a historical oncoming or onslaught of the spirit of God that under the fire and the glory and the power and the intensity of his coming, our eyes are open to behold wondrous things out of the Word of God. One of the things that makes me marvel is the fact that only when the Spirit of God overshadows us does the Scripture open to us. And in interims, historical interims, when the Spirit is not moving in an intensity, not much is seen out of the Word of God. Just the same thing that has been seen and has been proclaimed. I have seen that. I have learned that as a lesson of history. And if you're present in the body of people God visits, and the next time he turns up the heavenly rheostat of power, you're going to see some marvelous things. And also, the beauty of it is, it's not just that an isolated individual sees it, but there is a corporate seeing. I had wonderful fellowship with Erskine Holt in Florida, and I guess he's a man in his 60s now, and he had the good fortune, or should I say grace, to be present in the intensity of the latter rain and have many of the experiences being translated, being totally possessed by Christ until God spoke through his mouth. It was as though God himself stood on the platform and saw the entire building full of Bethesda come forward and fall on their faces. You can't make audiences, groups do that, except God is on you. Something beyond an anointing, total possession. Amen. Gerald Durstein had that when the spirit fell among the Mennonites. He went to town to get his hair cut, and when he crossed the little bridge, God totally possessed him. He was like another person. He went into the ministerial council where they didn't dwell on any of these things that we dwell on here at Pine Crest and stood up and God spoke through his mouth with such an authority and a persuasion that all of those people of the ministerial council believed it was God. And they sought God and had a revival in that town. God saved many. Well, I don't know that I could prove it theologically, philosophically, or by scripture. You know, the Bible has some profound statements, very profound statements that we kind of slip right over. You know what I mean? There, there, there's one way of treating the gospel where you're like a water skier. You have your, your, your dynamic, your, your motivation, you've got your power boat, and you've got a rope, and you've got your skis, and, and you just skitter around all over the surface of things. You make a lot of waves and throw a lot of spray. But there's no penetration. It's on the surface. It's dynamic, but it's superficial. There's another way of dealing in the gospel and in the kingdom where you could imagine you're holding the two handles of an old moldboard plow and you got a horse or a team of mules on the front and the thing is digging in. You can feel that penetration and that coming to grips with reality and you know that something is being done. And some of these scriptures, I marvel at how they've been passed over. I was talking to my friend Roy Rose who was He's 70 years old now, and he was in the latter rain revival. And I said to him, I don't know why I said it off the top of my head or if God caused me to say it. Sometimes the Lord causes you to say things. Did you ever have that happen? You go somewhere, you say something, and it, it, it sets off a spark. And I said to Brother Rose, I think it was four or five years ago before I, when I still lived in Detroit, I was down in Ohio at a house meeting one night. I said, Brother Rose, what did God say to you men, you brethren, back when the latter rain fell. What did God say to you? What was a foundational scripture? What was the main idea? What was the thrust of the message? 
And this is what Brother Rose told me. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's an ontological statement. That's essentialism. That's the deepest thing in us. What is it? What's its essence? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now in the same passage of scripture, Jesus said to Nicodemus, in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Como sino rom shufan zi pokotrobo iash murutia suvonikumai. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, my God, my God, my God. We hunger and we thirst. Praise God. Sister Sylvia, you were telling me about something you saw in a dream, and a voice spoke about, what did it say about travail? There is a travail in the land. There is a travail in the land. Now I feel the power of God manifesting in that word. You see how you can tell the word of the Lord? There's a science to this whole thing. I don't care what you call a man, call him a prophet and put him in an office, but everything he babbles out isn't the word of the Lord. There is a travail in the land. Now see, when I pronounce that word, there is a witness of the Spirit. There is a radiation. You can throw out all manner of noble, uh, philosophic, theological words, and God will not do anything. You say the word that is in his heart, and the Spirit of God will leap into dynamic action, hallelujah, to materialize, to realize it. The church age has gone by like watered down time's noiseless river while this reality of the kingdom that can be gripped has slipped out of men's hands. I am talking about the present aspect of the kingdom again tonight. I'm saying it could be put in simple words like this, Jesus is here. And it is my thesis that Jesus Christ is the kingdom. I was befuddled about the kingdom for years, and now I know. Without being able to offer you hard intellectual type proofs, Jesus Christ is the kingdom. We'll get to that a little later, the Lord willing. The Lord unwilling, we won't. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. I would guess because of the form Jesus couches his words in, he's emphasizing, wouldn't you? That if Jesus ever says, Verily, verily, if him who is the embodiment of truth comes and says, Truly, truly, that is more profound and weighty than us being in court and swearing with our hand on the Bible, isn't it? Infinitely more so. Truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now we could put it in something like, what is it, a mathematical corollary? It's been so long since I studied, I don't know my terms anymore. Could we say it's something like this? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, if a man is born again, he is seeing the kingdom of God. Amen? Jesus said in John 14, he says, the world, let me turn to it, such a, an important passage. Looking for a certain passage here in John's Gospel just comes to my mind. Jesus said 
If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. You see that word seeth? Depend upon, de dependent upon new birth. See, new birth brings into the world new reality, new creation, new constitution, a new entity, a new being. Something that is more alien than the Superman myth where a baby is catapulted from the planet Krypton into the earth. That, that's, that's still all of us uh, relatively the same nature. This is utterly different in nature, completely alien completely different, completely revolutionary, totally new, new creation, something that did not exist in the entire created orders of the universe up until this time. We have failed to grasp the revolutionary character of all of this. The world seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless or as helpless orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But look at it now. But you will be seeing me. But you will be seeing me. Because I live, ye shall live also. As I sat in here the other morning, I suddenly saw truth from the parable of child birth. And I saw that though when a woman is with child and there is joy because of the conception and though even the Bible says that when a child is born a woman forgets her sorrows for the joy that a man is born into the world Yet there is some point at which nothing will substitute for travail. There is at least a time, it may be a very short time, short as 10 or 15 minutes, or a few hours, but in that time nothing, nothing, nothing will substitute for travail. We will not attain the desire of our hearts by mere rejoicing or by believing a charismatic thesis or proposition that praise is the answer. I would say the right quality of praise is part of the answer. That's as far as I can go. Could you say amen to that? Yes. And I believe you can sense that the praise in the church is like nature in the poem Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. He speaks of the eternal note of sadness in nature that all of the sounds of nature, the, the, the surf and the wind and the storm, the volcano, the everything, the river, all is in the minor key. And in all of our rejoicings, you can feel an undercurrent of unfulfilled desire and of a travail that wants to surface itself, that a prophetic channel might be born in the world again, that God might be able to speak. Hallelujah. I have become highly and painfully sensible recently of the fact that you, God's people, are clammed up. That there is a certain clamming up. That there is a divine reality in you that wants to burst loose. That wants to come like a, an eruption of a volcano, but it's, it's clammed up. It's sealed. It's got to be burst loose. Hallelujah. And it's going to break loose. All that's written in the book will come to pass in time. The Lord showed me that from the parable of birth. We have got to give ourselves to this proper travail. John Wright Follett considerably gave himself to intercession and travail. And many of the other people we speak about and the only reason we speak about them is they weren't in the mold of other people. They broke that mold, 
And through this travail, that which was within them that wanted to come forth came forth. Yes. I think there's a very real sense, as been said by someone, that never is a soul born again, but, but someone travails them into birth. Now, we don't know who. We cannot always connect who travailed for whom, because this is an unseen, largely unseen realm. But I believe that when it comes to bringing forth the ministry, you will bring forth the new and the real you, in a sense. I believe you must travail to birth your own prophetic ministry, and all New Covenant ministry is prophetic. Moses said, I wish all God's people were prophetic. Well, in the kingdom it's come to pass. They're all prophetic. Praise God. So now, let me turn to John chapter 5. Five and thirty-seven. Jesus said to the Jews, You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Verse 37. Latter part of the verse. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him you believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that you might have life. I saw today as I meditated this religious scene in Israel as a total shambles, and Jesus Christ walked into the middle of it total shambles, and told them the truth. In my most radical reasonings, and I'm a free thinker with a radical type of a mind, I could never see things as bad as it is recorded here. I would criticize them and find fault, but I could never give the devastating, absolute criticism that Jesus does. You have never seen God. We listened to a tape last summer at Brother Valores of a man who has tried to, even had designs on Pinecrest, though few people know it. And uh, <clears throat> he tried to snare Brother Roy Jacobson and would like to use him as a, an ambassador, a ready-made apostle for this man's distorted message. And uh, Sergio had one tape. The man preached two or three hours on a tape. He preached until he was out of breath and pant, preaching that old-time holiness style of turning on the, psych uh, the power of the flesh, you know. And among other things on the tape said this. He said, almost all of the Christians in Jerusalem, of whom there were 40,000, filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, he said almost all of them were children of the devil on the tape. And Brother Sergio said something. It was quite devastating. Sergio said, this man does not know God. And I agree. Hallelujah. You will not come to me that you might have life. And I'm not hitting you as a congregation with that tonight. I'm talking about the universal state of the church. This is the way the Lord gave it to me the other morning. Uh, Sister Harris was running through these scriptures and God began to unveil some things. You will not come to kingdom. You will not bring yourselves under divine government. You see? And there's a real reality in this. In fact, you've heard Brother Joe teaching on uh, the kingdom and talking about what the Schofield notes. Well, came to my mind this evening. I just opened up my little Schofield Bible. I suppose I've derived some bondage out of this thing. Don't use it anymore, really. Had it tonight, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is stronger than bondage. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And this is what it says here in the Schofield Notes. I just want to read this incredible thing to you. And after the Sermon on the Mount, or the Teaching on the Hill, which I like better, 
we get in so many religious ruts, you know. Everything gets traditionalized and conventionalized. And here's what they say in the note. Having announced the kingdom of heaven as at hand, the king in Matthew 5 through 7 declares the principles of the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount has a twofold application. Number one, literally, to the kingdom. Now, this, the writer, Schofield didn't write this all, there's a whole list of names in the front, but the writer is conceiving an earthly, literal, carnal kingdom when he uses the term literally here. That's, I'm very much persuaded, false interpretation. I think this is one of the greatest debacles the world has ever seen to have a humanistic interpretation right with the text of the Bible. Soul as a Bible. This is one of the things God's been laboring to deliver us from for the last 30 years. And so he says it applies, number one, literally to the kingdom. That's a political outward thing that's to come in the future in their thinking. In this sense, it gives the divine constitution for the righteous government of the earth. Whenever the kingdom of heaven is established on earth, it will be according to that constitution, which may be regarded as an explanation of the word righteousness. That's a very good statement. The kingdom of God is a, an unfoldment of the term righteousness. His way of doing things right. As used by the prophets in describing the kingdom, and he gives several Old Testament scriptures. In this sense, the Sermon on the Mount is pure law. Did you hear that? Pure law. Here again, rendering the New Testament as law again, something is going to be clapped on you like handcuffs or stocks or a pillory or a, or a, a, manacle, a manacle or or a chain around your neck, you see. This is called heteronomy. That means taking a being and superimposing on that unwilling being a law that it does not want to obey. We will say a little more about that later. He said you could uh, view this scripture here as pure law and transfers the offense from the overt act to the motive. That's good. Here lies the deeper reason why the Jews rejected the kingdom. They had, entered, they had reduced righteousness to mere ceremonialism and the Old Testament idea of the kingdom to a mere affair of outward splendor and power. And even this note is doing that same thing, reducing to externals. They were never rebuked for expecting a visible and powerful kingdom, but the words of the prophets should have prepared them to expect also that only the poor in spirit and the meek could share in it. The 72nd Psalm, which was universally received by them as a description of the kingdom, was full of this. For these reasons, the Sermon on the Mount, in its primary application, gives neither the privilege nor the duty of the church. Do you hear that? He is saying here that the Sermon on the Mount is not intimately our business in this age. It is for the next age that's coming. Now, Jesus says, you will not come to me that you might have life. Now, I want to use another scripture here that God reminded me of. We're getting into revolutionary area. How many of you sense that before God's will is done in this earth, there are going to be some tremendous upheavals in our thinking? We're not going to be as we are now and do these things. We've got to be changed. And it is a very scary thing to let God change you. Moses, in his transformed state, it's terrified the children of Israel. Now, in chapter 7 of Acts, Stephen made a statement, which I again link with the kingdom. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, Stephen said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Let's read it this way. You do always resist the kingdom. You do always resist God's government. For the Holy Ghost in the earth, as he is delineated in the lives of prophets and kings and priests, in Jesus Christ and in the early church and apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and the whole church was God's government in a people, was it not? God had his way through that instrumentality, through that spiritual channel. Now, back in the Old Testament, 
when Moses was at the Mount of God, and to understand what he's saying here when he says, as your fathers did, so do ye, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Every time there was a redemptive historical plateau reached in Israel's history or the church's history and God offered something, in some way it was rejected. And turning back here to Exodus chapter 19, I believe it is, God made a statement. The Lord said in Exodus 19 and 5, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words with the, which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses then had an encounter with the people. And the people said in verse 8, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And then is described the terrifying sight on Mount Sinai down uh, farther in the chapter. And over in verse 20, the Bible says, giving us the response of the people. Chapter 20 and verse 19. People saw all these things in verse 18. Then they said to Moses, Speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Now in order to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, they would all have to hear from God, wouldn't they? And have direct communication. Amen? But they said, we don't want this. And so then you can find where the Lord... Now see, what God was doing here was offering to them a phase of the kingdom. And it's described in those terms that I just read to you, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They rejected that greater phase of the kingdom for a lesser phase, which was to take one tribe and make them priests for the whole nation. So there is a place where they resisted the Holy Ghost, a rejected kingdom, you see. And I have come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the kingdom partly on the basis of Luke 17 and 20. Where the Pharisees asked him when the kingdom of God should come. Jesus then answered, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation or with ocular vision. Either shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you, or among you. Among you in my person, and in the person of my disciples, you see. There was a little knot of people in the midst of Israel in whom God was reigning by his spirit. Do you see it? And do you see the blindness of the Pharisees in their externalizing vision? It just mystified them. They always spoke to Jesus in terms of an external vision, never perceiving God's moral and ethical kingdom of the heart and of the spiritual realm. Praise God. And you can see that down through history, I believe there's a statement in Hebrews that would illustrate this. A statement in Hebrews where it talks about entering into rest in chapter 4. Speaking about entering into rest. And in verse 7 it says again, He limited the certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. The hardening of the heart is the resisting of the Holy Ghost. Resisting of God's rule and God's government. Necessitating God to rule circumstantially with hard things, captivities and wars and famines and pestilences and natural disasters that speak louder apparently to men than the soft approach of the love and grace of God. You see it? And he tells us, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Our sole labor is to labor to enter into that rest. Praise God. So the Lord gave me a few unveilings of his kingdom. 
And so I'm saying that Jesus Christ is the kingdom. That Jesus Christ represents everything in the kingdom. You can see Jesus Christ as the man who never lacked anything, can't you? Isn't that evident in Jesus? With such a, with, with, uh, and he had this characteristic in such degree that he could minister out of send him forth and ask him to come back. He said, when you went, did you lack anything? They said, nothing, Lord. We didn't like anything. Because they wanted his word. He is the all-sufficient one. El Shaddai can be rendered the all-sufficient one. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What I believe the Sermon on the Mount is, is law, but not the kind of law they make it. I believe it's not an externally imposed law. I believe it's the law written on the heart of Jeremiah 31. See, Jesus said, I will not leave you as, as orphans. But he said, I will hurl you out into the arena of conflict with the laws of God's being written on your heart. And you will function as new creations because that law is implanted at the core of your being. And it will flow out through you and revolutionize your life from the core to the periphery. Glory to God. You know, I was meditating tonight and thought of this, the, the Lord's Prayer. And it starts out this way, Our Father. You know what that tells me? That he has made himself responsible for us. My wife and I are wholly responsible for this new baby. That she has food and clothes and that she is bathed and given a place to sleep and protected. Is that right? Wholly responsible in the eyes of natural people. And it flashed upon me when it says, Our Father, he has made himself responsible for us. In other words, God has me on his hands. God has you on his hands. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Yeah. Hallelujah. There's another statement here that <clears throat> elucidates this law written in the heart. And Jeremiah says, The law is written in the heart. And Ezekiel says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. The formal and the dynamic realities of God. Form and content. He's responsible for it all. The structure of our life and enough oil to run it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He is the life and the dynamic. And he says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. He will teach us of his ways, you were singing tonight in the opening song. What is that? The ways of his kingdom, the ways he governs. Not the ways he blesses and gives goosebumps and gives you everything you want that's shiny. That will all come with it. But fundamentally, the way he governs his universe and the way he governs this new creation, this new age that is a warning. Did you know that historically every age has come out of the womb of the preceding age? And that right now we're in a transition, an overlap, where a new age is coming into being. I believe that people all over the world in this, whatever you want to call it, modern visitation or falling the latter rain or charismatic renewal, I believe we're becoming aware of what divine kingdom really is. That God will live in them and will cause them and will make them and he will work in us even the will to do his pleasure Hallelujah. his good pleasure isn't that tremendous yes. we have failed to comprehend how utterly dependent we are upon him and the working of his life within us praise God well this is this just a stumbling introduction do you think that Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount about something that could only come into operation after a whole age he elapsed? Wasting his time telling a people who would never need it or use it or perceive it or walk in it something to tantalize them? Something they have to die and come up in a future resurrection before they'd ever see the reality of it? I believe he was telling the people it was meant for. Praise God. 
all the folly of imposing structures on top of the Bible and trying to make it line up our way. Even if it's not for this age, the Bible says there is a class of people. Praise God, I just want to read about them. Just a little a brief statement. Let's see where this is now. talks about a class of people in Hebrews who have tasted the powers of the age to come. You ever consider that? A class of men who have tasted the powers of the age to come. Must be Hebrews chapter 6. Yes. I just want to make that little reference. They tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Here again, you have the formal and dynamic principle, the form and the content, form and substance. God's law and God's spirit. You know what grace is? God's own power of being. When God's grace comes into you, you will be in some measure like God, and you will talk like God, and you will think like God. Grace will do that. You know, in my studies, I have found... I am beginning to penetrate some of the things that are binding and paralyzing the church. I don't expect anybody else to believe that I'm seeing it, and I don't expect them, except there is fruit of it, and it's proved in power. But I believe I'm penetrating. One of the great curses and one of the great uh, binding forces upon us is this. We are in an arrangement that is basically an affair of the heart and of an inner substance that will work its way out where we are in relationship with God and we intuitively know his mind. We intuit the mind of God. We receive direct communication in our consciousness from the mind of Christ, the mind of God. Do you know that? His knowledge is in us. But we live in a society that has been structured by Aristotelianism, which is wholly externalizing. In fact, Aristotelianism has given rise to the modern scientific and technocratic world, technological world. Aristotelianism is the most incompatible philosophy that you could ever imagine with New Covenant reality. And it has caused generation after generation of Christian to look out for an external sign of the coming of the kingdom of God and to miss this whole burning issue of relationship. That's a big problem, and unfortunately, theology got rendered into his philosophic category. And when's the last time you heard of theology, and I'm not against theology, producing a revival or saving or regenerating or revolutionizing a society? There are many other, other scriptures I could get into here tonight, how the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. You know that scripture in John is not talking about the physical sun shining through the vacuity of space or on the dark side of the moon or coming into a place that was physically dark. That speaks of Jesus Christ stepping into human society and not just any old society, a specially prepared Jewish religious society. And the Bible says the darkness comprehended it not. And that word in Greek there is katalambano, it means there was nothing in that society that could get a hold of him. Nothing. That's what it means. Catalambano. It means to seize a thing. It means that had those people properly responded to God and properly profited by the old covenant experience and had their high priest and all their priestly orders been in order and had their prophets been functional, when Jesus Christ came, they would have rolled out the red carpet and says, Welcome. Thou king of the Jews. But they didn't do it. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Do you get it? See, there were no organs of apprehension in Israel. Just those few hearts that were touched by the light of the Holy Ghost of grace. The darkness did not apprehend it. A few people did. Zacharias did, Elizabeth did, 
John did. John didn't make any great boast. He says, I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize said, this is he. He pointed him out one day. John had limited revelation. But Paul says, I have eagerly seized him. I have seized him greedily. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O Lord. That's the kind of response God wants. This is a very unfinished subject with me, but God is speaking and gripping me with the kingdom. Do you earnestly desire for God's kingdom to come into your life? The government of heaven, the rule of the heavens, the Malkut Shemaim of the, of the Hebrews. And even in that term, kingdom of heaven is revealed the weakness of the Jews. They were so scared of the holiness of God that they quit pronouncing his name and they forgot how to pronounce the redemptive name of God, Jehovah. That's not how he pronounced it, of course. No man on earth knows today because the Jews had that superstition. And so when Jesus Christ came, their God came into the midst and they did not know what his name was. They had a, just a vague idea. And of course, Jesus pronounced that word two or three times and they wanted to stone him to death for it. And I am astounded at how the first part of the church age matches up with the latter part. There seems to be a lack of apprehension of kingdom, of life in the spirit. You see, my thesis is that life in the spirit is the kingdom of God. I do not discount that there will be a final consummation when all creation and the whole universe will be brought under its sway. But that is not offered today. We must receive the phase God is offering wholeheartedly and say, yes, Lord. Even saying, yes, Lord, implies kingdom and all of its implications. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's just a little exhortation about the kingdom. It's a serious matter, isn't it? Deeply serious. And we are a hungry people and a frustrated people. And this aching void that is within us, God means to fill it and satisfy us. Amen. Praise God. Who's going to close the service? You, sister? Got a chorus? Praise the Lord.